I met John Beelan 50 years ago. He was in his early 20s and I was in my late 20s. We were put together because we did a project called Swamp Water. And we'd like to talk about it and remember some of the good things and the bad things and hope you enjoy it. I think John was standing in the middle of a solar sunspot when we did this because his picture is awful. But I think his words are worth a thousand pictures. Living off the land, catching what I can, I'm a Louisiana fisherman. Woman gets by on crawfish pie till the big fish bite again. John. There you are. Now I yeah, hi. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, yeah. Uh, I'll probably keep a copy of what we're doing. Can I use some of this stuff with your... With, with oh, your absolutely, group? sure. Yeah, yeah. Over time, I've had some pretty interesting stories, and probably not as many as you've had. One thing is I'd be interested to delve into a little bit on swamp water is... Uh, I made a relationship with Starty King, and they, at about 67 or so, they hired a guy named Dexter Schaefer. And uh, I met him, and he took a liking to what I did, and then he came to Albuquerque and looked at my operation. Dexter was a guy I got to be friends with everybody. He worked with uh, Leon Danielle. Oh, yeah, well, I remember Leon. Dexter Music, they were all buddies. So one day, Leon said, this is the way I believe this happened. Leon said to him, I think we're, we're interested in, in a group called Swamp Water, and and maybe that uh, there's kind of a new rock country, you know, whatever he was going on. He said, hey, maybe, maybe you should talk to us about doing it in New Mexico. And and I and I told her, she said, well, I don't know if anybody wants to come to New Mexico, but I'd like to get some feedback from you on this. Yeah, yeah. But there's some things that are real clear to me. But here's what I remember: we went to the uh, Ramada Inn yeah. at, at, in uh, Hotel Circle, which was kind of near my studio. So. We did that, and I, I never forget this. I, I checked you in. They made a room, and I checked you in. They wanted a damage deposit. Yeah, <laughs> I, said, I remember. Damage deposit, well, for I, I kind of was not too in touch with everything, but I, I guess a lot of things have been going on in the country. So I said, okay. So I gave them I, $250. I don't remember what I gave them. And then at that point, I think what we did is get a good night's rest and we would start on Monday. But here's where I'm getting, here's where I get fuzzy. I know the first day didn't work out well. So I called Leon Danielle and I said, Leon, I'm not sure this is the right situation for me or for them. And uh, I'm pretty much wanting to bail on this. I, I don't think I want to do this. I said, well, I like, I like every, the idea of this thing, but I just, something is not right today. And we've been here a day already and we only had a week. Leon said to me, let me call and talk with them and I'll call you back in a little bit, an hour or two. He called me and he said, we've had a long talk and they're willing to take, give it a try and see what we can do to work together. And he said, will you, will you do that? And I said, I'm not sure. I said, I, I, I just don't know. I said, he said, and so finally Leon said, look, Give it a go for me. I mean, just let's just give it a try. And if it doesn't work out, we'll quit. I don't remember having any issues during the recordings. Mm -hmm. I don't remember having any attitudes. I don't remember anything except we were making great music and it was fun. I think what I did is I used the three track first and we recorded bass, drums, and a guitar. Uh -huh. And then I submixed that. I either did it to mono or to two track. And I think probably mono, you know, in those days, a lot of people were still doing mono. And then we used one track for vocals and we used one track for any other dubs that we want to do. But of course we had to do them in one. You know, well, we could punch in the dub. And then at the end on four track, I already had a mixed basic track. We mixed the voices in and we did Cause I remember on Saturday we, we wrapped it up and you all left. Do you remember any of that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I remember um, or, originally Gibbs, uh, Gibb had a solo deal uh, ready to go with uh, Starday King. When, I, when, when he and I first got together with, uh, with Linda, um, I was told Gibb had a solo deal. 
And uh, that was okay because I actually had one too with Randwood Records. And uh, and so we were both, you know, going to be doing solo careers. But as rehearsals went on, those first rehearsals with Linda, um, we started sounding really good, you know. And also we sounded different, you know, with Gibbs fiddle and, and kind of like my kind of guitar. We kind of had this unique sound and it kind of, to me, it sounded kind of like Creedence Clearwater meets the birds or something. So um, we talked about it, you know, and uh, we decided that we wanted to change the Gibbs solo deal to to be a group, you know, and we, we, call, we would call it Swamp Water. And um, Thad wasn't even with us. I think Thad joined right before we recorded that album with you. Uh-huh. And so... Um, uh, so that was cool. And so we got the, you know, we were told that we were going to be going down to New Mexico and, and, uh, and I think what it was is that we didn't really, we weren't really thrilled about going all the way to New Mexico to do an album when we had all these recording studios in Hollywood that we, that we could have used, you know, why New Mexico? And then when we got there, I remember we got there and it was pretty desolate. I mean, there wasn't much going on in Albuquerque in 1970. And, uh, so, and we had trouble with the hotel guy. The hotel guy uh, g- gave us some grief about, uh, I, the first day we were there, there was some kind of ammonia spill or something that happened at the hotel. And and uh, and I, I can't remember all about it. I do remember we had a little problem with him. When we came in to work with you, if I remember, I think we were all a bit confused on what, well, what direction are we going to be? Because I always felt that we were going to be a rock band. We were going to be a, like a country rock group, you know, and like Credence. And um, I didn't picture us being country really at all, you know? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I think, I think the label and Leon or, or the label may have felt that it was going to be a, maybe a country act. But at that time there were no country self-contained bands. You yeah. know, so what what chance did we have to, to break into that market? And the, the funny thing is, Gib and I both were, were very, very uh, educated in country music. We had a pretty, for our age, we had a pretty extensive background in it. You know, I had written some country hits and so had Gib. So the first day we were a little unsure, you know, and, and uh, but I think we we all decided that let's just see what happens. Don't let's don't even look at country or rock, just play what you got, you know, yeah. and, and you allowed us to do that. And, and I, I, I think out of the four of us, I was probably the most vocal, uh, probably in the studio as far as arrangements and, and doing stuff. Gib Gib was always a little passive, you know, uh, yeah. he, he was a great singer and Thad and Stan were pretty passive too. Thad, Thad, Thad and I both were pretty uh, assertive, I think. But um, I, I felt that w- once we got going, we kind of hit this niche. And the neat thing about working with you was that you you did what, what, what good producers should do. And that's to be able to uh, allow the band a little bit of uh, elbow room to do what they do, you know and and see and see where it goes and sure. uh and and once you did that we did fall into a real groove i mean we got one track after the other after the other yeah and uh and it worked out terrific we never had one disagreement in the studio and um when, when you started see i didn't even know exactly what we'd be doing but one thing is is the minute you started I, you know i had i had spent so much time i'd go to la with something slightly country and they'd say take it to nashville I'd go to Nashville with something that was slightly rock and they'd say, take it to LA. Yeah, right. Going through that in Albuquerque. And so, but I just liked what you all did. I mean, it was like, uh, it was like magic to me. And, and. Well, it was pretty unique at the time because, um, uh, you know, the, the problem we had were when the the Eagles didn't come around until the Eagles came around in 72, I think 73. And, but prior to that, um, everybody else like Poco and uh, the dirt band, we all ran into the same problem, you know, radio wouldn't play us cause we were sure. too, you know, too this or that. And uh, so there really wasn't any groundbreaking group. That was the important thing about the Eagles when they hit it so big, they really opened the door for everybody, you know, but back then it was pretty desolate country. You know, I mean, we, uh, um, on stage, we would kill them. I mean, nobody could follow us with yeah, Linda yeah. on stage. It was just, Gib would take out the fiddle and we'd do Big Bayou and the place would go crazy. But radio just wouldn't have, you know, much to do with it. So 
you know, to be able to actually be in New Mexico and do what we do was actually a smart move, I think, because back in L.A., we weren't influenced by people coming in saying, well, you need to do this. You need yeah. to do that. Oh, it's too country. Oh, and that's too rock. It'll never work. You allowed us to do all of those uh, um, things that we felt like, you know, worked. And once I really identify with what people are doing, you know, my job always is how can I make them do this the best that they can do right. for themselves. But I didn't, I mean, I, and you know, I felt being honest, you know, I was kind of a young green guy. I, I had very little equipment. I was in Albuquerque. I was fighting the battles. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, yeah. I, I hadn't done a lot of things. Now, the Wayne Cochran thing right before you was pretty involved that I did. And I, I didn't know if I could do that. I mean, when they put me in, in that deal, I thought, you're kidding me. <laughs> He's got a state <laughs> band and playing in Vegas. And, but, you know, I, I did the same thing with them. I, I liked what they did. And I met it. his ranger was a great guy. And I let him, I worked with him to do yeah. what we could do. And so, and of course, the first thing he did was a country song, uh, Life's Little Ups and Downs. And, uh, but so, but it was interesting with, with y'all is that um, I remember it being such a pleasure and, and the songs were so great and, and the performances were good. And I just remember this four days of getting to Saturday when we kind of mixed it and, and it was done. And I, 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 when I think back to those days, I mean, I, sometimes I work for three weeks on a song and I'm not happy. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, John, uh, you know, Gib and I, uh, uh, and um, mostly Gib and I, because Thag was relatively new to, to the scene, but Thad had a little recording career before. But, but Gib and I had been making records, you know. We, 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 we had an understanding of it, you know. I mean, uh, Gib, Gib was 10 years older than me, but, but uh, I, I had been, you know, by the time I got into Swamp Water, I had been playing on commercials and, and, and records sure. and my session work two years was pretty full two years prior to that, you know? So well, when we got together, we, we, it, we're working with you. We kind of had a general outline on, on, you know, of what to do. Whenever you made a suggestion, we totally understood it. Yeah. We were, we were, we were pretty much pretty good pros. And also, you know, we had been working nonstop on the road with, uh, with Linda, you know, so we were pretty tight, you know, I mean, we, we, uh, we didn't, we didn't have to explain much to everybody, you know, and one thing I always loved about working with Gib, even with the burritos years later, that Gib always uh, allowed me to, um, uh, to uh, get my uh, ideas across, you know, I mean, he, he was always good at that. He was a smart guy. I mean, he knew everything about country and, uh, and I learned so much from him. Um, but he, he, if he, back then he was really good at letting me kind of, uh, work with swamp water and taking it to, I, I didn't want us to be a country act. Sure. I thought at that time, country to me, I mean, I, I like country, a lot of country music, but the, the industry itself, I thought I, I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the idea of buses and, 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 uh, corn balls, you know, yeah. uh, the, the whole corny thing of country. I didn't like, I, I was more into like the Everly brothers and, uh, you know, the beach boys and the you know, credence of course. And, and so that's where I saw swamp water. And, um, fortunately Gib allowed me, you know, Gib could have easily have said, no, like, you know, this was my solo deal. We, we should do it this way. Yeah. But he stepped back. And I, I think, I think that was instrumental with us uh, attitude wise was at that time we were hanging out a lot with the birds with uh, Clarence White sure. and Roger McGuinn and them. And we watched them, you know, we studied them quite a bit in the way that they, uh, the way that they sounded and their, their direction and stuff. So they had, a, they kind of had an influence on us too. Uh, we, uh, we never pigeonholed ourselves into being a country group. That's why I kind of cracked up when Take a City Bride actually made the country charts. <laughs> I kept thinking, boy, if they could see us, that record would go right off the playlist. It sounded good. Shetty baby, ton mama et ton papa a toujours dit j'étais pas bon. I got a house on stilts and a five dollar bill that's sitting on the banks of a muddy, muddy bayou. That's a lot, lot better than the streets of crowded cars, pawn shop friendly neighborhood bars. Oh yeah, you know the funny thing about Swamp Order is that. Uh, 
by the time we got to you, we had already played the Grand Old Opry with Linda. We had already done the Johnny Cash show. We had already recorded. We already re had recorded in Nashville with Earl Scruggs and Johnny Darrell. We uh, went to Earl's house for dinner. I mean, we 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 really cemented some really strong country ties uh, when we were with Linda in 1970. Yeah. The weird thing about it, uh, not l looking back, is that after the uh, first album, and I was really happy with that album too. I thought it was great, and uh, I wanted to continue with the you know because it made sense to me that listen, we need the first producer that we had because I mean we're onto something here. Let's don't change it, you know, and yeah. and Gib felt the same way too. But, but uh, uh, we weren't picked up by Star Day. I don't think they may have went out of business. We got an offer to join, uh, or I mean, to from uh, Larry Murray, uh, who was a, he was a songwriter and a, um, a songwriter, and he did the Hoot Nannies at the Troubadour, and he was kind of known in L.A. You know, and um, him and his partner Ken Mansfield, who was kind of a fairly known uh, record executive for Capitol, uh, they offered us a. a um, an album deal with with RCA, and uh, but the the deal was that Larry had to Larry was going to produce it. No, I had worked in the studio with Larry, and before, and I really didn't find him to be that capable of of a producer. You know, I had been I had worked with some really top guys before Larry, and sure. I, it was obvious to me that he was pretty much of a novice. And uh, but I went ahead with it because it was RCA, and we thought, wow, you sure. know. Sure. So we, you know, we did that second album and it was talk about uh, um, trying to pull a molar to uh, molar tooth out of out of your head. I, I battled with uh, with Larry and Ken throughout the whole album and we did part of it in Nashville and part of it in, in L.A. And uh, and I was always stopped in my tracks if I if I had some ideas that I wanted to get across. It was always, um, oh, don't worry, we'll get to that kind of crap, you know. And, uh, and, and so the, that, that al second album, I hated it. I hated the way it was mixed. Um, I thought the songs were really good, but the, the way that it was produced and, and the way that it was recorded, um, I, I blame that entirely on the production uh, people that we were with, you know. And there was a big difference between working with them and working with you. Working with them was a very school uh, ma schoolmaster kind of environment, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, just because... In, you know, the, 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 prob the problem I had when I was young and, and doing a lot of sessions and coming up on, on the scene was I was young. And, be and, and, and a lot of times that worked against me. I would have, like, for example, in Swamp Water with RCA, I would have the producer pretty much talking down to me like I was like, you know, an 18 year old kid. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I had this whole discography in front of me before I ever got to RCA, you know. But it was real frustrating. And finally, um, at the end of that album, um, it had a horrible album cover on it. Just the whole direction was just for crap. Uh, I finally quit and I, and I went with, um, but at that time we was with at RCA, we were, we had changed from Linda to, to Arlo Guthrie and we were backing him up. Yeah. But I, I, I could see Swamp Water going nowhere with the, under the conditions that we were we were under during that um, RCA album. So it, I, it was it was kind of heartbreaking because I, I had uh, high hopes for Swamp Water. I thought sure. we were unique and the fans loved it. And but finally I I, uh, I left. When I heard the RCA album when it came out, it was shit for a lot of reasons. But another reason was it came out on that new that brand new lacquer that they started using, you know, the real paper thin lacquer yeah, that came out yeah. in 72, all of a sudden it went from thick lacquer to this kind of like wavy thin crap. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and I know that affected the sound, uh, the, the mastering sound of the album and the album just didn't sound right, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and the mixes, there, there were stuff on the mixes that were left, uh, um, uh, mistakes and uh, noises and certain things um, so I, I just thought this is crazy, you know, I mean, I, I'm not happy doing this at all. So, uh, I left and, uh, I think the guys tried to carry on, but, uh, they broke up a few months later too. You know, John, I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm midway through my second book and, uh, it's a follow-up to the first and there's a story. It's the, the book starts with a little, little story that sums up what I think the music business is really like. And uh, I was with Mac Davis in 1977, and we were touring all over the country. 
and we were playing at another one of these fairs. You know, they were all alike. They're all yeah. at a at a fairgrounds with a racetrack, and you're a hundred yards from the first row. You know, so anyway, we're doing a sound check, and uh, and I look over to the left, away in the distance, and I hear this big bang. You know, and I look to the left, and they just they had just shot out the human cannonball. You know, the guy went flying out in the air. You know, yeah, and yeah. landed in the net. So I went, wow, that's pretty cool. So we finished our sound check and I'm walking back to the trailer dressing room, you know, well, as I'm walking to the dressing room, the human cannonball is walking towards me. You know, he just gotten out of the net and he's coming my way, you know? So we're both walking across this field and it, we, we eventually meet up with each other and he's got this evil Knievel suit on and, and there's smoke coming from it. And he's, his face is all, all dark. And, and I don't know what, I, what to say to him, you know? So we pass each other. And the only thing we said was I looked at him and I said, uh, Hey, how's it going? And he looked at me and he said, tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's to me, that's the music. This is tough crowd, you know? Thanks for listening to John Bielan and I talk about life, health, and other things getting in the way of our music dreams. I've got some more coming with John Bielan. I hope you stay tuned to New Mexico Sound, where we talk about things that are very dear to our heart.